Morning, everyone. <laughs> I'll get closer to the mic in a second, but it's really great to be back in Cape Town. And I spent quite a long time here, about 20, 25 years uh, close to, and uh, moved up to uh, the big smoke, Johannesburg, uh, exactly two weeks before lockdown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't the best move. <laughs> so uh, my talk is uh, it's quite, quite a sort of a daunting topic. I, when I first looked at it, I thought it uh, was nurturing curiosity and creativity and learning through AI. Um, but actually, it's really exciting. There is so much we can do in this space. Um, so let's have, a, let's have a little bit of a look. So what is AI? So it's really a generic term at this stage, or general term, um, for uh, it encompasses an ever-growing uh, list of areas. As, um, so there's natural language processing, which is probably one of the most interesting and important ones at the moment. Um, and that really refers to the way that uh, uh, AI, like ChatGPT, is able to understand human uh, language um, you know, and we can actually use, uh, uh, when, we, when we use AI like that, um, we can put in a, a really sort of a detailed prompt into ChatGPT and it understands that and, and generates coherent results. So it's a really exciting thing. There's many, many other areas about it, but essentially all AI systems are built um, around two primary ways. One being um, through a set of uh, rule-based systems that humans have provided it with, or now, um, uh, much more so at, um, through machine learning, so algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms. So is AI new? Yeah. It's, it's actually not. It actually has got a really long history. So I think one of the interesting things was uh, Alan Turing, um, very famous uh, computer scientist, um, scientist in general, um, in 1950 wrote this paper called the uh, computing Machinery and Intelligence, and it's worth a read. It's not complex. Uh, it's, it's about 21 pages, and it's such an insight into this great man's uh, mindset. Um, and so it's, it's, it's downloadable, and it's really worth it. So if, if you uh, see the first line of it, uh, where he talks about the imitation game, uh, so you might remember that 2014 movie called The Imitation Game, and that's where the name of the movie uh, cam comes from, really. Uh, so what he proposed, uh, he was asking a question as, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? You know, so this was a topic in 1950, is, is it possible that machines could, could think? Um, and he then unpacked uh, that we need to understand what is, what is a machine, first of all, and what is thinking. No, what is thinking? And he developed this idea called the imitation game, which was that uh, we could take a computer and take a human and put them into two separate rooms and have them connected at the time, I think he called it teletype, uh, to connect them to an interrogator. And the interrogator would, would ask both, and the interrogator wouldn't know uh, whether there was a, a computer or a human in, in which room, and would ask questions of them, and the computer could answer and the human could answer. And they could also try and trick the interrogator in thinking that the other one was the computer. Um, and so the idea would be that once the interrogator was convinced that the, the computer was actually a human being, then we'd reach that point where, where um, machines can think. So, and it's, it's a really interesting paper because he also looks at some of the questions about um, the, the ethical issues about it and what was, the, uh, you know, what was the theological sort of barriers to it, philosophical barriers to, or, or resistance to having a thinking machine because we perceive ourselves as top of the tree. We are the thinking beings and nothing else can think. But he challenges that quite a lot. Yeah. So it is quite a roller coaster of a history. So 1950, Alan Turing's imitation game. Um, 1956, there was a conference um, where the, in fact, where the, the term artificial intelligence was first coined. Um, and at this conference, um, these guys kind of really rocked the boat and they, they, they brought this program, the, the logic theorist, um, which mimicked for the first time human problem solving skills. Then in the 1970s um, to the 1980s, at, at, there was kind of a, a drop in development. And a lot of that is to do with something called Moore's Law. So Moore's Law states that the number of uh, transistors on a microchip doubles every two years. And so sometimes what's happening with, and it happens periodically with the development of technology, is that uh, just the processing power of our, of our computers is just simply not big enough uh, to, to take the next leap forward. And that happened 
1970s to 1980. Um, and so what you saw with it is because of kind of uh, stagnation in, in development, because actually in the beginning, 19, uh, they, they, were, they were really uh, uh, very bullish about AI in 1950. They, they thought within 10 years. Alan Turing, um, he in fact said within 50 years. He said we will see a, a, a fully thinking machine within 50 years in 1950. And he wasn't too far off. We, you know, we, we were about to close to it. Um, 1980, there was um, another system that, uh, for the first time, mimicked uh, human decision making systems of experts. And then 1982, John Hockfield uh, popularized deep learning neural networks. And again, this also talks to what I'm hearing the saying is, is, is one of the recommendations that you made about it is that we shouldn't kind of build a computer system that. Uh, is like an adult, and we, we've given it all the data and everything. And he proposed at that time, really quite amazing, was uh, we should build this computer system like a child with an empty mind, a uh, relatively empty mind, um, and allow it to learn. You know, so he really proposed that, and so he sort of ran about 1982. This became uh, a reality. There was a lot of investment in 1982 to 1990, and in Japan invested about $1 million, which is a lot of money at that time, into AI and processing. And again, we had another slump in the 1990s, and funding dropped again. And our team to 1997 was a breakthrough with uh, uh, IBM's uh, e Blue uh, beating a world uh, chess master, Gary Kasparov, for the first time. So there were changes and developments. And I think what Alan Turing said is we can see a short distance ahead, but we can see that there's, there's plenty there that needs to be done. We succinctly said that. This talk uh, in the PowerPoint, uh, which I think is available to everyone, is um, there are links in it at the bottom, so you can link to the source articles and all that type of thing as well. All right, so uh, who remembers Johnny Cash? Okay. So Johnny Cash, uh, born in 1932, died in 2003, but in 2023, recorded Barbie Girl. Are you aware of that? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it won't play on that presentation, but I'm going to play it from my phone. It is That is actually not Johnny Cash, um, but that's an AI. Um, you know, so that's an AI, and, and, and there's an AI system called Voicely that you can actually take. You can make your own mashups uh, between your favorite artists and get them to play a song. So I mean, just thinking about creativity there is, you know, how, how exciting that you could actually, for instance, um, write a song. Um, and then get your favorite artist to actually play it for you. you know? um, have some fun with it. You know? So there's some really interesting things there. You know, so AI right now is busy exploding into the, into the public domain, but obviously it's been there in the academic spaces and the research spaces for, as you saw in the, the previous slide, for a long time. You know, there's been development happening. But we're now in the space where um, us mere mortals uh, have access at our fingertips um, to many, many, many powerful types of AIs. And not only us, but all have access to, to these materials. Yeah. Right. So uh, that there, uh, you might have seen, I think it was in about uh, July or August, um, where the Hollywood actors were going on strike. Um, and one of their prime reasons was um, to do with AI. You know, that they their uh, IP uh, is being uh, taken from them in a sense, you know, where you actually have an artificial intelligence that's able to mimic them completely, as you saw with the voice one there, um, and also in terms of actually creating an a, a avatar of that human being um, and put them into a movie. So we might have immortal actors uh, 
coming to us, uh, coming to a theatre soon. Yeah? So it's quite an interesting thing. So AI, um, you know, these are the, what's happening today is, is it sparks a lot of debates, um, but these are not new debates. I mean, as you know, um, you know, there's things like 1942, Isaac Asimov, the famous science fiction writer and scientist, uh, uh, proposed the three laws of robotics in 1942, and that subsequently uh, modified it to the four laws of robotics. Um, and then, obviously, Alan Turing, um, in that paper, we listed a lot of objections. Um, if you remember a movie in, 19, in the 1982, I think it was uh, Blade Runner. Um, so um, that was based on a book, Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep in 1968. And that was questioning uh, many things, you know, like, um, for instance, um, you know, when does a being, when does an artificial being actually be treated as a person? That, and and that's, a, that's a debate today that's happening too, is, is, you know, is there, will we reach quite soon a point where AI will actually be given uh, legal status as, as a, as a, as a thinking entity. Yeah. At Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey, so the, the, the rogue computer system HAL, um, which I didn't actually know until recently, stood for, stood for something, and it was this heuristically programmed algorithmic computer, 1968. Yeah. So a lot of this is entrenched in our psyche as well about AI, um, you know, that it might actually be malevolent, um, you know, that it's going to go rogue on us. And there are concerns, obviously, about that, you know, that um, where, you know, what are the, the lines? Are we going too quickly with AI right now? You know, um, is potentially the, the case. And do our laws, our laws caught up with the developments that are happening with it? But that's also a symptom of the fourth and p perhaps fifth industrial revolution that we are in today. What we do know is that AI in the education space is going to grow incredibly um, in the next few years. So this is a, a forecast from last year, oh, 2020, 2022. So the entire global market for AI and it, just in education was about $3.9 billion. And it's going to grow to about $47.7 billion um, by 2030. So there's going to be a lot of AI interventions into, into our education space. And we also need to understand how that might impact on us. But I think that's actually staggering growth is at 36.6 uh, compound annual growth rate, you know, percent per annum, you know, so that it's growing by, which is amazing. So Dr. Nicole Turner, in a paper that was called AI and the Future of Teaching and Learning, um, said first and foremost, uh, AI systems are getting deployed in educational contexts that are already fragmented and broken and unequal. Technology doesn't discriminate, we do. So as we think about the application of the new, these new systems, we really need to think about the contextual application of AI. And I've got a little bit about that paper in this presentation as well, which is, is quite interesting, how, to, how the educational leadership is engaging with how we will use AI and what is the role and, and advocating for teachers um, and educational leaders to be at the center of development of this new educational technology that, that is coming to us. Yeah. So, uh, a fun and interesting question is, could AI replace t teachers? Yeah. So, this study, uh, yeah, yeah, no, please don't throw things at me, uh, yeah, because I definitely don't believe that, and um, you know, that's, that's, that is not the case. Wait for the next slide, and then you can pelt me with stuff. <laughs> yeah. But uh, McKinsey did a study last year, um, which was very interesting, where they were um, this was a global teacher survey um, they did. And as you can see on the screen, um, it, it is showing that about 50%, 49% uh, of the teacher's time is actually spent in interacting, direct interaction with students. And the estimation is that between 20 to 40% of this other gray area, at least, could be automated um, or dealt with with uh, technology and most definitely utilizing AI. You know, to, to do that. You know, and that would give teachers about 13 hours per week um, teaching time, which they could spend more effectively with, with students, you know, with it. So it, it is pretty interesting. If we harness this technology properly, we could actually be doing a lot more as, as um, educators. So there's a, um, I've got a link to it in the presentation, but there's a good study that came out from the US. Uh, Office of Educational Technology, um, where they uh, considered AI in education and said, 
most definitely uh, teachers need to be, and students need to be at the center of this development as well. Um, so a human-centered approach to AI and realize there's many things that it could do. So for instance, it can it foster new interactive experiences, um, enables communication between students, teachers, and computational resources. So I mean, I think the day is uh, potentially of um, where we're looking at application skills that we need, you know, we need to be computer literate in terms and that, you know, that meaning about, uh, if you look at the coding and robotics curriculum, we've got the whole strand application skills in there. Um, I challenge that as I think um, pretty soon that's going to be totally irrelevant. I think we, were, we will soon reach a point where we will have an Excel spreadsheet um, replaced by an AI and we will simply talk to the AI and say, hey, I've got all this information here, I need you to analyze it and listen this way. You know, I need the results. And I don't, because I don't know about you, but I really don't care about learning equals concat, open brackets, you know, range to this and this. It's not really fun, you know, it is, it's, you know under, doing that is not, the, is not what you're really after. What you want to be able to do is to analyze the information. You want to, that is where you're trying to get to, and you have to have this big hurdle to, to actually do that. You, know, you have to become a, a, an absolute master Excel specialist to actually analyze this type of stuff. And I even think things like websites are going to disappear. Um, you know, I think websites, as we understand them, within my guess, 10 years, we will not see websites in the same way that we see them today. And that when you go to a web address, you will actually be facing an AI, um, an avatar, it might look human, it might not, uh, might be dressed in a corporate uniform of whatever website you're on, and it'll ask you, how can I help you? And you can talk to it. You know, you will talk to the AI and say, well, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that, and it could have a, because of our track record that we've got on the internet, all our history and all that type of thing, it could actually make very tailored uh, recommendations and suggestions to you as well. And I think we're going to see that a lot more in the future instead of us having to navigate websites and uh, you know, unnecessary stuff and speak to an AI. If you look at things like ChatGPT at the moment, um, who's played with ChatGPT? <laughs> awesome. I think there's... Everybody should, should be on it and trying it out. It's amazing. There's, you know, but the, the, the downside of it, it, when I think about it, is um, it's a bit like uh, uh, approaching the oracle. You know, so we've got this kind of like oracle there because the, you, you talk to the oracle and it provides answers from the divine uh, cyber heavens uh, to you. <laughs> But it doesn't give you sources, does it? You know? um, so it's basically, it's unlike when we're doing a, a Google search and we, are, we know to look through those searches and to critically analyze where, this, where the sources of the information is. And is this relevant? Is this not fact checking? It's very hard to do that in the chat GPT type of space right now because you cannot see sources unless you own like a premium option and things like that, then you don't believe you can. You know? Um, so, you know, that also is what do we do with learners when they're utilizing a resource like this? So how do we get them to examine, uh, yes, ChatGPT said that, but is it the gospel, you know, type of thing, you know, is, is, what do they need to do? So, uh, some of the exciting things that are in the AI space is um, we can address diverse student learning styles and, and tailoring education to individual needs. Um, and you can see that is, um, you know, so I, t I teach special needs learners at Chartwell Center for Coding and Robotics in, um, at a school in Kailami in Johannesburg. And there, I've been able to, and I also teach mainstream learners after, after school that come for coding and robotics sessions. So on weekends. So, so what happens is, is I've developed materials for my mainstream learners. And then I can take that same worksheet and plug it into ChatGPT and say, please, adapt this for this age, uh, this, this worksheet for this age, um, and make this slightly more simplified you know, with it. Generate that and have a look at it, and then I will do tweaks to it, obviously. Um, you know, but there's a content that I authored initially, you know, and, and it then reversions that content, and then I've actually plugged it into another AI and said, please generate an assessment for me on this. So I've got two assessments. One is for the mainstream learner and one is for the special needs learner um, you know, that I'm, I'm catering for with that. So those are, you know, those are very practical, simple things you can do. Another thing I've done with it is, which I just mentioned is actually amazing, is, um, is coding and robotics and AI um, are Swiss army knives. 
Um, you know, they, these are incredibly, the subject coding in robotics is incredibly versatile. Um, so I work with the maths teacher, the agricult agricultural sciences teacher, the hospitality studies, art, woodwork, uh, English, mathematics, and talk to those teachers and say, what are the common problems? So currently at the school, well, at, at the beginning of the year, one of the major problems was measurement. The kids were having a lot of difficulty with measurement. Yeah? And we then developed, in tandem with those different teachers, um, coding and robotics lessons um, that taught these skills yeah, with it. So I encourage you to look at the AI, to look at AI like that as how can this be utilized in a, in a really exciting cross-curricular way? Um, so for instance, you can put in a prompt into ChatGPT and say, um, take, take a look at a grade seven to nine natural sciences and please let me know which topics from the grade seven to nine natural sciences could be taught uh, in a cross-curricular way using coding and robotics. And it will pull those topics out for you. It will list all the topics and it will actually give you suggested lessons you know, with it. You can then take one of those suggested topics and say to generate a worksheet, or generate a lesson plan for me based on that specific topic. So it, yeah, this is what I'm saying, is we're actually in a very exciting space with it. You still need to look at it critically, um, but you could be using it to save yourself a lot of time. Okay. Um, so, here on the screen there's what is um, something from Harvard Business Review, wrote some, a really, really good article which is linked to in here to, um, about how AI can be used creatively, mainly in a corporate space, but um, a lot of the suggestions within that article are very directly relevant to the education space. So things like adaptive learning paths, um, AI can analyze each student's learning style, strengths and weaknesses and provide a customized learning pathway. So really, what does that mean? You know, is we could be talking, we, I, I'll have a, a student who's key interest is rugby and another student who's interested in fly fishing and but we need to teach a, a single topic to those learners but we can ask the AI to generate the lessons uh, around that child's interest um, with it and actually they each have a personalized worksheet for it which we cannot do by ourselves today we don't have the the capacity to 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 do that type of thing so there's some really amazing things this little uh, image that's on the the right here is, uh, so I was doing an agile uh, uh, lesson with the kids and saying, and using toothbrushes and footballs and hula hoops and things like this to teach agile um, and design thinking skills and to get them to build a, a bunch of different games um, you know, with it. And then we, we, the lesson was about agile thinking, design thinking, but also about um, uh, game mechanics, what makes a good game. So they, they, they came up with some ideas. While we're doing this, one of the toothbrushes broke. You know, the head of the toothbrush broke. So they, they developed a game, some of the kids developed a collaborative game where they'd had two toothbrushes in their hand and they would pick up the, the, the soccer ball. So I gave them, when I do this, I give them a bunch of eclectic objects uh, to, to try this out. And it gets their minds thinking and they have to develop a game out of that. So they would throw the, the soccer ball with the two toothbrushes and another kid would have to catch the, the soccer ball. And they built this collaborative, very interesting collaborative game out of it. But when the toothbrush broke, it, I said to the kids, have a look at this. Here's the toothbrush, here's the handle of the toothbrush. Why do we throw this whole thing away? You know, I said we, you know, we, what do we use? We just use the bristles. And then as soon as the bristles are worn out, we throw away the whole toothbrush. And after Cape Town, when I used to walk on the beach, I would see a lot of those type of things wash up onto the beach. Yeah. So we said, let's open this AI um, called Open Art, and let's see if it can design for us uh, some ideas about toothbrushes with uh, disposable heads. So that we'd have we'd be able to replace the the head of the toothbrush and not throw away the whole thing. So that's actually an AI generated design for that. You know, so that it's not perfect, but it's an idea. And it generated about four different designs. I just popped a screenshot of the one up there for you to see. But we could take those ideas and actually examine them. So I'm, I'm the, I don't have any artistic ability. I have I'm, I'm an ideas person, but I could use the AI to bridge that lacking skill that I've got to generate something like that. And then uh, we could start to think about how we might uh, code that or, or at least build a prototype using a 3D printer um, from, from some schematics like that. The next slide here, this one on the screen is one of many ideas. Is, so this was the prompt that we gave this AI, um, this open art AI um, was 
uh, give us some designs for a solar powered uh, window cleaning robot that is shaped like a caterpillar. And this was its interesting design you know, that, that came up. You know? And that's a completely generated design. There's not, I mean, it's not that it's mashing photographs and all that. It's, it's an absolutely artificial uh, construct. You know, that, and it made many of these, which I thought was amazing. You know? So to lastly uh, to talk about is there, there, for instance, is that's the AIs uh, coming up with ideas for a, a coding and robotics classroom, how, you know, how it might look. And you could take that first, first image or choose one of those images that were there and say, right, but make this now for 20 learners. Make this uh, cap you know, capacity for 50 learners or add in this or change this. And it will actually work with the prompts that you're doing. You know, so in conclusion with, with everything, because I don't want to take too much of your time, I know you've got a long day, is um, you know, the, the really encourage you to play with uh, these, these tools that are out there and think creatively about how you might utilize them. One very interesting idea that um, uh, I've seen and uh, I stole from someone else and we're trying it out at the school is put into ChatGBT um, a, a prompt such as we are at a conference and there's 200 teachers there, please write a play. Please write a play about 200 learners attending the Oxford University Press Digital Summit um, and uh, make it a 20 line or a 20 line play with it. And it, it will generate a play for you and then you say to it, now please change this into a Shakespearean style. And we will have uh, ye old, you know, and it will. Uh, it's really fun to try, you know. So, and the kids at the school are basically taking those AI-generated plays in their drama, um, and and then are acting the the play out. So, the, so that their agency is they're not having that they are coming up with ideas of what the play should be about, plugging that in, and then just generating a script uh, for it, um, and and then the kids are are acting it out in the drama in the drama classroom as part of English, which is great. You know, like that is pretty much so. The last thing I just want to mention is, is would be wrong of me not to allow uh, the artificial intelligence to give you some ideas about uh, ut utilizing creativity in the classroom. Is um, so. This is ChatGPT's voice. Is so. It says, um, when implementing these ideas, it's crucial to maintain a balance between structured learning and open exploration, allowing students the freedom to follow their interests and cultivate their creativity with AI support. Yeah. So you've heard it from the oracle itself. Yeah. <laughs> and just on the screen there, for people who haven't tried it out, is um, you know, so this was a prompt: is can you create an example lesson using 0.7 above? And 0.7 above was um, was uh, gamification, utilizing AI for gamification purposes. And I said, create a sample lesson uh, using gamification, suitable for 10-year-olds who are interested in colonization of the moon. So natural sciences next term, they will be doing, um, in the grade four to six space, they'll be doing the solar system. So I have a whole lot of the coding and robotics sessions that I'm setting up are going to revolve around uh, robots exploring, um, you know, um, and robots building bases, and Project Artemis, which is NASA's, uh, uh, NASA's mission to set up a permanent base on the moon. And, uh, hydroponics, how are we going to grow food on the moon, uh, all this type of stuff. So there's lots of fun things we can really do you know, with it. And it actually generate very, very quickly a, a, a very awesome lesson you know, with it. And with a bit of tweaking, it's good to go. Okay, thank you so much for your time. <laughs>